Have you ever watched that, uh, that TV show called Pawn Stars on the History Channel? You ever seen that one? Um, the last several weeks I've been watching clips of, of Pawn Stars on uh, uh, YouTube or even sometimes Facebook, and I find it fascinating. I, I find what people value fascinating and what they come and try to sell at a pawn shop uh, and anything from, uh, you know, pieces of history, a historical firearm or jewelry, first edition video games or first edition comic books, uh, and every, anything and everything in between, uh, sometimes even instruments owned by famous musicians or even props that were used in famous movies. What intrigues me so much about that is what people value or what they put value on. I mean, I've seen first edition either video games or comic books sell for like hundreds of thousands of dollars. I mean, can you imagine paying for a comic book, hundreds of thousands of dollars, uh, uh, the type of money that we spend on our homes, on a piece of plastic or just a little comic book, and yet people do. One of the more, uh, I don't know, hilarious things about the show is sometimes... Uh, people bring in things that they think have value, but they don't. And uh, there's, you can, I think there's an episode called Deals Gone Wrong. And, you know, people will bring in something that has a lot of value. And the, the store owner who he says, hey, I don't know what that is. Maybe it, maybe it is worth what you're asking, but, you know, let me call in an expert. So they call in an expert and the guy comes in or the lady comes in and evaluates what they have. And just to tell him, it's like, you know what, this is a fake. It's not worth anything. Or no, it's not worth $10,000, it's worth $500. And people get pretty upset, you know, and many times they're, you know, they'll have a little clip of them saying like, you know, yeah, they don't know what they're talking about. They're only an expert, but they have no idea. I know what I have, and it's not worth for me to sell it for only $500 or whatever it is. However, sometimes people have something of great value, and the expert will come in and tell them, hey, what you have is, is the original or it's, it's worth, you know, $50,000 or, you know, and the, the person gets pretty excited. And it's fascinating, too, because I saw this, like, first edition video game of uh, Super Mario Brothers that was worth $320,000. And I'm thinking, why is it worth that much? It's only a piece of plastic. But these things aren't valued that high because they're made out of expensive materials, they're valued that high because of how people value them. They're valuable to somebody. And they're valuable because someone is willing to pay that much money for them. So it's not in their intrinsic worth, but rather what value people have placed on them. Today we're going to be back in Romans chapter 8, and we're going to be looking at a section where God is said to have paid the high price of His beloved Son in order to save sinners. No, ever, uh, no higher price was ever paid for anything or anyone, and no higher price will ever be paid again for anyone or anything. God gave His valuable, precious Son in order to save sinners. It demonstrates how much He has chosen to value us. But not only this, because He has chosen to value us this much, it also teaches us that He will go out of His way to make sure that we are taken care of. Or put another way, being that God sent His only beloved Son to die for us, guarantees that He will also take care of us. So if you have your Bible, please turn to Romans 8 as we learn more about this and much more and by how the cross teaches us that God is for us. God is for us. We'll see that in verses 31 through 34. So let's begin in verse 31, where Paul writes, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? 
Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Father, help us understand what the Apostle Paul, under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, wrote for us in these pages of Scripture. We want to be more like your son. We want to be matured. We want to be strengthened. We want to be encouraged. So please do that in us by your spirit, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, the first thing we see here in this passage is what I would call the clear evidence that Paul gives us that God is indeed for us in verses 31 and half of 32. He says, what shall we say to these things if God is for us, who is against us? And if you remember from last week, we looked at verses 28 through 30, and we learned that God sovereignly uses all things for our good, even the bad things. Remember that? No one and nothing can prevent God from doing what He is going to do. And, and last week we learned nothing can prevent Him from completing our salvation. Paul then asked this question. It's actually a rhetorical question, meaning it's, the answer is obvious or it's self-evident. You, meant, you might wonder, you know, is Paul questioning whether or not God is for us? When he says, if God is for us, is he saying, well, maybe this isn't true? But from the context, that's not the case. We can probably translate that. Since God is for us, who is against us? Now, to be sure, these things refer at least to what he has just said, what we learned last week. We talked about what we called the unbreakable chain, remember, of redemption, of salvation, meaning those whom God foreknew, He also called, and those whom He called, He also justified, and those whom He justified, He also glorified. However, many commentators, along with myself, believe that these things refers to much more than what He has just said. In other words, Paul is not just referring to the immediate context, but he is in fact, referring to what he has said in the whole letter so far in the book of Romans. Think about what we've covered so far. Think about what he said at the beginning of the book. Everyone, all of humanity, is condemned in their sin and that our only hope is in Christ Jesus. Right? We learned that from the beginning. We learned that God publicly displayed Jesus as our acceptable sacrifice. We have to think about what shall we say to the fact that we have been saved by God's grace and His grace alone? What shall we say to the fact that His grace is emphasized by the fact that we have to receive the gift through faith? Right? What shall we say to the fact that we are now dead to sin and now alive to God? That's what he's referring to. What shall we say to these things? And indeed, last week is a condensed summary of those things. But Paul is referring to what shall we say to what God has done for us in Christ. And Paul's point of saying that, what then shall we say to these things, is that since God has done all of this to save us, our conclusion be, must be that God is for us, not against us. And if He is for us, as He clearly is, none can be against us. Right? No one. That's the obvious answer. What shall then we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? The obvious answer is no one. No one can be against us. If God has done all of this for us in the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ on our behalf, it becomes crystal clear that God is for us, right? Not only do we have the truth of the gospel that tells us that, everything that he's discussed so far in his expanded explanation of the gospel, but we also need to consider who God is or the person of God. Right? He refers to God being for us. Consider what God has done for His people. Consider who He is. God is, as we know from the Scripture, the Creator. Everything exists because God created it. From the vast stars and the planets that we see in the sky to the, the, the very small particles of energy that we call atoms and everything in between. God 
made everything by the word of his power. God spoke and they were created. There is no higher power than God. He is the Almighty. So if he is for us, Paul says, who then can be against us? The resounding answer is no, no one. The all-powerful, almighty Creator, if He is for us, none and no one can be against us. And he goes on to further emphasize this point where he says, beginning of verse 32, He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all. Now this is a pretty simple, straightforward answer of the Gospel. However, when we stop to think about and maybe even meditate on what this means, the, me- the, the meaning of it isn't just simple. It is one of the deepest and most profound truths in all of the Bible. God did not spare His own Son simply refers to the fact that God sent His Son to be born of a virgin, to live a perfect life, die on the cross for our sin, and then raise from the dead. However, what becomes more apparent the more you think about what this means and all that it entails is that this statement, if you think about it, will increase in meaning and in depth. Here's what I mean. We know already that God the Father, God the Father loves God the Son to the uttermost. God the Son is precious to Him. He calls Him His beloved Son. The Father said of Jesus that He is well pleased in Jesus. God the Father and God the Son have enjoyed a perfect, loving, and intimate relationship. They have always enjoyed that and they always will. Right? The the relationship between God the Father and God the Son means they're in perfect harmony. They never fight. They never argue. They never disagree. They are always in complete agreement. And for these reasons and many more that the Scripture will describe, the Son is precious to the Father. There is no greater love than that which the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, for that matter, enjoy. They are in perfect harmony. Now stop and think about what we've learned about ourselves. What has Paul told us so far in the book of Romans? That apart from Christ, everyone, all of humanity, is utterly and hopelessly lost in our sin. Right? Since the fall, since Genesis 3, we have, apart from Christ, exchanged the worship of the Creator, whom we know we should worship. We have exchanged that for a lie and rather worshipped something of creation. We know that God is worthy, and yet we ignore that. We worship what we should not worship. We know this is wrong. We know that this is unholy, that this is sinful. So we suppress that truth in unrighteousness. We try to ignore the fact that God is worthy of our worship and obedience. right? And He has made His displeasure of this known to us, right? Paul told us, by handing us over to our own sin. right? We've seen this in the rampant uh, sexual perversion that has been true of all civilization. The fact that our minds don't work the way that they should. Paul tells us that we have a depraved mind. Chapter 1, verse 28, right? We can't even figure things out. We can't even distinguish anymore what is the difference between a male or a female. Some, you know, Many of us think that everything that exists came from nothing. Talk about a mind that is depraved and doesn't work correctly. Or sometimes we think that our offenses that we have made against God, that we can somehow make up for them by our own religious practices, that somehow we can justify ourselves. And to make matters worse, Paul told us that we're born this way. We are in Adam because of our connection to Adam. Our father, when he fell in Genesis 3 into sin, in Adam all have sinned. So we are hopelessly lost And we are also hopelessly unworthy of God or of His concern. Now think about those two things. This strong, intimate, perfect relationship that God has with His Son, His beloved Son, and the fact that we are unworthy of His concern or care. And we begin to understand what that statement really means when it says, who 
he did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. When you begin to realize how much the father loves the son and how unworthy we are of God's concern, you begin to understand how deep that statement means. It comes into vivid focus. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. In the context, the all there are those who are called according to his purpose, those who love God. If God did all of this for people who are infinitely unworthy, we can with utter confidence, absolute certainty, say with Paul that God is for us. He's already demonstrated that in Christ. I mean, think about what this means practically in our lives and how it should affect the way we live. Think about this. I'll put this on the screen. When you doubt if you matter to God, if you doubt if you matter to God, look at the cross. Look at the cross of Christ. There are times when we wonder how much we matter to God, right? And this can happen for a number of reasons. We may lose a job. Right, that we need to provide for and support our family. Sometimes we have strife within our families, right? When our families fight and disagree with one another or they hold grudges because of something that happened in the past and they don't want to let it go. They don't want to talk to each other. They don't want to gather with one another. And at those times, we, we see that, we feel that, and it, it's hard and it hurts and, and we can be tempted to think, doesn't God care about us and, and, and what we're going through in, in these broken relationships within our family? When we lose a loved one to death, when a, when a child is, is, dies in the womb or, or, or we lose a, a loved one to death or, or you suffer harsh treatment within your family or in a job from others, when you've been abused in some way, whether physically or mentally, these types of things can lead us to be depressed. We have a feeling of hopelessness or despair. We can be tempted to think to ourselves, do, do, does God really care? I mean, if He really cares, why are these things happening to me? Why do I have to endure? I mean, He's able to prevent or change them, so why doesn't He? Doesn't He care? Let me tell you something. According to what we just read about how much God does care for us, He may abandon our nation to sin. And it's pretty clear that He has. But He will never abandon His children for whom He sent Christ to die for. Never. We matter to God. He will never abandon Abandon us. He is for us. Paul has made it abundantly clear, right? Those whom he foreknew, he predestined. Those whom he predestined, he called. Those whom he called, he made right. That is, he justified and he glorified. God will do what he intends to do. He will take us to glory, which is an emphatic statement that means we matter to the living God. When you're tempted to doubt it, look at the cross. And you'll be reminded how much you matter to Him. Now, being that we do matter this much to God, we should expect then God to take care of us. And that is Paul's conclusion as well. This is why the second half of verse 32, Paul addressed what I call the expected provision of God for us. In other words, we should expect that God would provide for us. If He has done all this to demonstrate how much He cares for us and to save us, we should expect that He would provide for us. And that's Paul's conclusion too. He says, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? You see how Paul reasons that way? If God has done all of this for us in Christ, and all that it means... How will He not also freely give us all things? He's already demonstrated in the Gospel how much we mean to Him. So he asks another rhetorical question. In other words, if God has so utterly saved us in Christ and that He will complete in us that which He started when we are glorified and no one can change this, of course 
He will with Him freely give us all things. The issue then is we need to identify and understand what what does He mean? What does He mean by with Him? And and what does He mean by all things? What does He mean when He says with Him freely give us all things? Well, as you know, context will always tell us and teach us on what something means. Context is king. And it will lead us to the correct understanding of what it means when he says with him. <clears throat> Obviously, in the context, it's a reference to him or he whom he did not spare, but gave him over for us. That is the giving of his son. In other words, since God gave his son in order to save us, he will also together with the giving of his son freely give us all things. In other words, the giving of God's Son is a clear indication that God will freely give us all things. But what does all things mean? Does that mean everything we want? Anything we desire? I mean, it seems to be fairly encompassing, doesn't it? All things? Does all always mean all or everything? Well, the context will tell us, right? What has Paul made abundantly clear so far? Verse 17, that we will suffer, right? It will end in glory that we will suffer. We've learned about that. We also learned that in the midst of our suffering, God will cause all of those things, even the bad things, for our good, right? Nothing will prevent Him from doing this. We learned that in verse 30. So the all things must be connected to what He has just said. In other words, it must include the suffering. It must include all things working together for good for those who love God. It must include His promise to take us to glory. This then leads us to the conclusion that God will provide everything we need in order to take us to glory. He will provide everything we need as all things work together for good. He will provide our needs here and now in order for us to end up in glory, right? Because who's going to ask, who's, you know, if He will freely give us all things, who's going to ask for suffering? Who's going to ask for difficulty, right? So He's not talking about what we want. He is talking about what we need freely, Give us all things. It's an act of His grace. We can even translate that as a, it's a grace gift. We didn't earn God's provision. We didn't do something to gain that. God gave it to us as a gift of His grace, like our redemption. Anything and everything we need in order to persevere, God will provide. Right? will not give us everything we want, but He will give us everything we need. Right? Like I said, Who would want to suffer? Who would want to go through difficulty? No one. But if He freely gives us all things, and that includes our suffering, and the ability to endure our suffering, He's not talking about everything we want. In fact, this is... Paul Paul says something like this in Philippians 4.19 that is connected to this. He says, And my God will supply all your needs according to His riches in glory in Christ Jesus. If you look at the context of that passage, you know that verse we know so well, I can do all things through Him who strengthens me. In the context of that passage, He says, hey, I can, I can persevere when I don't have much, or I can persevere when I have much. It doesn't really matter. God will give me strength and He will provide for my needs. God has already given us Christ for the salvation of our souls. It makes sense that He would also provide everything we need. Right? He already did that with our sin. Our greatest need because of our sin was Christ, so He provided Christ. point is that He already did this, He will also provide for our other needs in this life. And what this statement in the end of verse 32 teaches us is that if you are in Christ, God will always provide for your needs. The Bible is very clear. We've seen this many times. God has loved us completely and thoroughly in Christ. 
He chose us to save us before everything existed. We looked at that last week. Nothing and no one can prevent Him from doing what He intends to do, from saving whom He intends to save. So the conclusion is that He's not going to then leave us to fend for ourselves until we go to glory. God doesn't, as though He says, you know what? I'll meet your greatest spiritual need in Christ, but the rest of it's up to you. That's not the way it works. He will provide for all of our needs. This includes our daily physical needs. God will always, the Bible tells us, provide food and clothing for His people. This is what Jesus said, right? Matthew chapter 6, 25. For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink or nor for your body as to what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? He says, rather seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and, and these things will be added or provided for you. This does not mean, as I said before, that God will always provide everything we desire. Right? He may not always provide a life without physical weakness or disease. God may not prevent the loss of our luxuries. He does not guarantee that we will always have all the choices of food that we have. You ever stop and think about that when we eat? We rarely in this nation think about, man, I wonder if I'm going to eat today. I'm sure there are some who do, but the vast majority, that thought never crosses our minds. We always think about, what are we going to eat? What do I want to eat? What sounds good? Because we're so used to the luxury. But God doesn't guarantee that luxury. He doesn't always guarantee that we'll always have those choices. He doesn't guarantee that we will not lose our financial security. He may not prevent the loss of our freedoms. He may not prevent the the fall of our nation. He will, however, provide always what we need. I think we often consider what we have in abundance as our need or our needs. And we need to carefully distinguish what it is we need and what it is we want. Because sometimes God will take away the abundance, but that doesn't mean He hasn't provided for what we need. God will also provide for our spiritual needs. God will not allow you to be tempted beyond your ability. Did you know that? 1 Corinthians 10.13 No temptation, meaning there isn't any out there, has overtaken you. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God, who is faithful, meaning He will always do this, will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide a way of escape that you would be able to endure it. You know what that means? That you will never face a temptation that God has not equipped you to endure. Even if it's run the other way. God will provide you a way of escape always. When you're weak, God will teach you to rely upon Him. He will give you strength. When we suffer, we must rely upon Him. When we sin, God will provide the discipline we need, right? The Bible tells us God chastens, disciplines, his children whom He loves. right? So if we're living in sin, He's not going to let us get away with it. He will provide the discipline that we need. When we're down because of life and we feel beaten down, God will provide the encouragement we need. He will always provide for our spiritual needs. 2 Peter 1.3 Seeing that His, that is God's divine power, has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness. So when Paul says, what shall then we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare His own Son, but delivered Him over for us all, how will He not also with Him freely give us all things? God will provide for our needs. The next thing we see in these verses is what I call the abiding justification of God for us. The abiding justification of God for us. He asks another question. Verse 33, who will bring a charge against God's elect? Now we know what that phrase means, those whom He has chosen to save. 
Here Paul asks another rhetorical question. If God has already decided before creation ever existed to save you, who's going to bring a charge against you? The obvious answer is no one. In fact, this term, the elect, should remind us of a phrase that we're probably familiar with from the Old Testament in reference to Israel, right? Israel was known as the chosen nation or God's chosen ones. Here's an example. First, First Chronicles 16.13 O seed of Israel, his servant, sons of Jacob, his chosen ones. Right? This is why Israel is known as the chosen people. In fact, last week we were reminded, like us, Israel did not earn this status of being chosen ones. The reason they were chosen was because God sovereignly chose to save and redeem them. It is a gift to be one of His chosen ones. However, being that we have received that gift, being His elect, it is a clear statement that God has justified us. God has saved us. No one can condemn us. He goes on to say, who is the, God is the one who justifies, right? Who is the one who condemns? Think about what he's already said in the letter. What has he already said in Romans? God is the judge. He's the one who dictates what justice is needed when, and what justice needs to be met. He has already told us that everyone, all of us, have fallen short of God's glory. We've all sinned against Him. Therefore, we're all condemned. However, God not only required justice to be met, but He met it for us, right? He is the just and the justifier of all who have faith in Jesus. He provided Christ. We saw this in Romans 3. We'll put it on the screen. Whom God publicly or displayed publicly as a propitiation that's acceptable sacrifice in His blood through faith. On the cross, Christ was provided. This was to demonstrate God's righteousness. Because in God's forbearance, His patience, He passed over sins previously committed for the demonstration, I say, of His righteousness at the present time so that He would be the just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. When God justifies, when He declares someone righteous, that can never be reversed. It can never be taken away. It can never be lessened. Once justified, always justified. God is the one who justifies. No one can condemn us. Christ Jesus is He who died, yes, rather, who was raised. Not only are we justified by His death, but also by His resurrection. His death paid for our sin, and His resurrection is a demonstration that our sin has been paid for. Right? The clear evidence that Jesus was worthy is the fact that He raised, was raised from the dead. If Jesus didn't raise from the dead, but remained dead, it would have been because He was a sinner. And it was just for him to remain dead. But the scripture says he did not know no he didn't know any sin. He was sinless. Death therefore could not keep him, which meant that he was the worthy sacrifice. And he rose from the dead. The resurrection is the receipt that our sin has been paid for in full. And we have now, because of his sacrifice, been declared righteous. The last thing we learn in this passage comes from the last phrase of verse 34 where Paul refers to the ongoing intercession of Jesus for us. Who, speaking of the one who was raised from the dead, who is at the right hand of God who also intercedes for us. Now that phrase, the fact that Jesus is at the right hand of God who intercedes for us has a lot of meaning. A lot of meaning. The first thing it means is that Jesus had completed His work that He had set out to do. In other words, he requ what was required for our salvation, Jesus completed it. He's done. The work is done. Look at what the writer of Hebrews wrote in, in Hebrews 1.3. And it says that He, that's Jesus, is the radiance of His, God's glory, and the exact representation of His nature. And upholds all things by the word of His power. Speaking of Jesus, He is also the Creator. But look what He says here. When He had made purification of sins, when He had accomplished that, when He finished that, He sat down at the right hand of the Majesty on high. 
In other words, when Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, it's a declaration that His work is done. He finished it. He sits down. His posture of sitting at the right hand of the Father is a statement that the Father has accepted His work. He was welcomed back into glory because He accomplished what the Father had sent Him to accomplish. It also means that He is in a position of influence. Look at 1 John 2.1. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And the ideas are that you may not continually without repenting sin. But if you do sin, which he's already told us to go and confess that and be made right with God, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The fact that Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father and intercedes for us demonstrates that what he did paid for our sins. So when we sin, he is our advocate. He is our intercessor. He says again in Hebrews 7.25, Therefore He is able to save forever those who draw near to God through Him since He always lives to make intercession for them. Jesus intercedes on our behalf. His position at the right hand of the Father declares that our sin was paid for. Nothing can change this. No one can prevent it. Even when we sin, it doesn't change this. Colossians chapter 2. Beginning in verse 13 says this, When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh, He made you alive together with Him, that is Christ, having, having forgiven us all our transgressions, look at this phrase, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us, which was hostile to us, He has taken it out of the way and nailed it to the cross. That is the finished receipt that says paid for. It's done. It can't be reversed. Jesus died. Rose again from the dead. Sin has been paid for. The people of God have been justified. Our sin debt has been canceled. It is taken out of the way. It cannot and will not be held against us. Ever. Because it's done. And what these last two points remind us of and teach us is that no one and nothing including our sin, can condemn us before God if we're in Christ. Your sin cannot reverse or negate your salvation. You cannot. It's impossible for you to out-sin the justification of Christ. Your failure when you sin will not cost you your redemption. Now, I don't say that so that you can have that as an excuse. Well, if, I, if well, I'm saved already, I don't really need to obey because nothing can change that. Think about when we first came to Christ. What does God require? What is saving faith? We must what? Turn from our sin, repent, and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Right? When we repent, when we turn from our sin, it's because we're broken over our sin. It's because our sin bothers us and we know that God hates it and that we deserve judgment. So we come to God and say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Forgive me for sinning against you. That's why being broken over our own sin or bothered by our sin is a good sign that you have true saving faith. Right? If your sin bothers you, that's a good indication that you really are saved because our relationship to sin has changed. Rather than suppress the truth and unrighteousness, we welcome the truth. And this is includes the truth of our sin. Our sin cannot negate what Jesus has done. When He said, it is finished, He meant it. When Paul says that through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that in Christ we have now been justified and in our sin we can no longer be condemned, He meant it. This means when we sin, we can always come to God and seek forgiveness because Jesus has paid the price. Rather than lead us away from God, our sin should lead us to God. Because He's the only person we can go to to be forgiven. I don't know if you ever thought about this, but when you sin, God is grieved, right? We, we, we learn from the Scriptures that it grieves the Holy Spirit. He's displeased because it is sin. He doesn't approve of it. But when we sin, He's not angry at us. 
If you're in Christ, he's not angry at you. He's not mad at you. It displeases him, but he's not angry at you. In fact, when you sin, he wants you to come to him. He wants you to come and say, come, confess, agree that what you did was sinful, that it was wrong, and that it deserves judgment, but come and ask me to forgive you and I will cleanse you. And I will forgive you because Christ is at my right hand and He intercedes for you. You have been justified. I'm not mad at you. God says, I love you. I'm for you. And yet too often we think because when we're in our own sin, maybe God's mad at me and maybe He's just disappointed. and Maybe He doesn't want to talk to me. That is a lie. That is not the truth. When you read the plain reading of the Scripture, it says that God is for us. And if you question that, look at the cross. God didn't spare His Son. Why would He be angry at you? Why would He not want to speak to you? So when you struggle with sin, and you're in Christ, remember that God wants to help you. Because He is for you. He wants to cleanse you. Your sin is sinful. Which is why He wants to cleanse you from it. So, this is what we've learned. The fact that God gave His one and only Son for our salvation is a clear indication that He will always take care of us. And I don't know about you, but when I see the way the world is going, that is an immense, immense blessing to know that. Things might be falling falling apart around us. Things may not go the way we want them to go. But God will always take care of us. And if we doubt it, Paul says, look at the cross. Look at the cross and you will be reminded that God is for you, not against you. Amen? Did we get any questions? As the music team comes forward and as we get ready to remember Jesus, Lord willing, in a worthy manner at the table, I don't know if you have children. I have four And there are times when I stop and think about how much my kids mean to me, how much I care about them, how much I love them. And they're not perfect. None of them are, are they? But I would, and I'm sure you would too, I would give my life for my kids if I had to. I would not want any harm to come to them. I would want to protect them. That makes me consider and think about what God did for us. You remember the scene? This is where the temple would be when Abraham goes and offers Isaac because God said, hey, offer your son to me, your only son, the one whom you love. And before Abraham puts Isaac to death, he has the knife ready. And the angel of the Lord says, stop. Don't harm the the boy. Now I know that you fear me for you you, you were not willing to withhold your son from me, but you were willing to give him to me. God didn't do that, did He? God didn't withhold His son, His precious son, the one who means so much to Him so that you and I might be saved. That's what we remember at the communion table. Lord, Lord, I confess that too often my sin doesn't bother me as much as it should. That I don't appreciate the high price that You paid for us. And yet it doesn't take away from the truth that you still love us and care for us even when we're faithless, you remained faithful. Father, 
as we come to the table of your son. May we be reminded of the high price that was paid. Not because we deserve it, but because you're loving. Jesus, thank you so much. In your name we pray. Amen.